The Second Vatican Council said that atheism may be among the most serious matters of our time. We'll talk about how to reach out to atheists tonight on EWTN Live, so please stay with us. Doug Peck. I'm sitting in for Father Mitch Packwood tonight. He'll be back next week. And our guest tonight is a convert from atheism with a unique perspective on the challenges of the new evangelization in light of the fact that in his home country of Britain, for every one convert the church attracts, 10 Catholic children grow up to regard themselves as non-Catholic adults. Here to tell us more about it and help us address a similar problem right here in our own country is the senior lecturer in theology and ethics from St. Mary's University in London, the author of several books, including the Oxford Handbook on Atheism, another book on faith and unbelief, and his most recent book on the Trinity, How Not to Be a Heretic. So please welcome Stephen Bullivant. Great to have you, Stephen. Thank pleasure. you very much. It's a genuine pleasure. Thank you. You know, for when you me. first showed up here, I thought maybe uh, the professor sent one of his students. <laughs> <laughs> one of my students is Joanna Bogle. <laughs> right. Oh, so, so you, you, you're playing uh, vice versa there with her, right? <laughs> That's great because Joanna, so many people of our audience know her. Yeah, she's fantastic. Uh, and beloved uh, Real series and uh, Mary's. Exactly. Now, what? Look, tell us a little bit about St. Mary's. What is St. Mary's? St. Mary's University is Britain's largest Catholic university. It's not huge by kind of British university mm -hmm. standards, about 6,000 students. We're just in the southwest of London. Mm -hmm. And it was founded in 1850. So 1850 was when the hierarchy was finally restored after the Reformation. Mm -hmm. And there's riots in the streets and there's all kinds of stuff going around. This came kind of time of Newman, this kind of period. Mm -hmm. And St. Mary's was founded in order to train teachers to teach poor Catholic students from the kind of Irish immigrants mm -hmm. who were kind of up in the northern mill towns and that kind of stuff. So that's our heritage, but we, we teach all kinds of stuff now. Now you kind of came there in, in an odd way because, uh, and, and we can talk a little bit about your book, Faith and Unbelief, but uh, atheism, you also have the Oxford book on atheism. Uh, you started out as an atheist then? Yeah, um, I, I mean, I wasn't brought up as, as anything. Um, I wasn't baptized. Um, at, by the time I got to high school, I was reading Russell and A.J. Eyre and all kinds of people. Uh, I was very much an atheist. Mm -hmm. And then in the, the last two years of high school in, in Britain, you tend to specialize. So you might just take three or four subjects and then specialize further at university, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and it's common to go somewhere else, kind of mm -hmm. just for those last two years. At the one place in, in Preston, which is a fairly big town, um, I could have gone that I didn't want to go to was called Cardinal Newman College. Mm -hmm. and I didn't want to go because it was Catholic. But it was the one place, and this is probably quite telling, that did philosophy. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to do philosophy, so I went there. And then I went to university, I went to Oxford to study ancient history. Mm -hmm. um, but a few weeks in, I wasn't enjoying it as I as was convinced I would. And then thought, well, actually, I'd quite like to do philosophy. Mm -hmm. Now, at Oxford, you can't do philosophy on its own. You've got to do it with maths or physics or politics and economics or things I either wasn't qualified to do or had no interest mm -hmm. to do. But because I'd done some philosophy of religion, I found it quite interesting. Because I obviously had an ancient history background and the early church seemed quite interesting, mm -hmm. I could do it with philosophy and theology. So I thought, well, you know, I can do the minimum theology, the maximum philosophy, and I'll go off and be a philosopher and that'll be fine. Mm -hmm. But of course, it was always the theology that interested me. I'd mm -hmm. not read the Gospels before. Jesus interested me. The early church fathers interested me. And in terms of modern doctrine, it was mm -hmm. always the Catholic theologians that kind of fascinated me. Why do you think that is? Why, why the Catholic uh, theologians and why were you surprised as you read the Gospels? What was your reaction to them? Well, I mean, I think the thing with the Gospels is that everyone kind of thinks they know them. Um, you know, you kind of know the stories of Jesus and that kind of stuff. But we particularly start off with Mark's Gospel, so that was the first thing we read. And it's just, it's a gripping mm -hmm. story. And it's, and you kind of think you know it, and, but it, it raises as many questions as it answers. So, I mean, particularly Mark, because it's so short, it's so abbreviated, it's so kind of cryptic. Mm 
-hmm. It just made me, just in a, at this stage, just in a purely intellectual way, it made me want to kind of keep reading and, and find out more. And as I say, particularly the early church fathers, mm -hmm. um, you know, that kind of, that generation, I think particularly in the second century, so these were people who were very often not brought up as Christians and certainly in a, in a non-Christian uh, background. So these were people who were being confronted with, with what Paul calls, you know, the foolishness of, uh, of God. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this scandal, this, this, this folly, and you know you can either recall from that or you can be excited by it. Well, why do you think you had a different reaction to it than the other gentlemen and women who were in your classes? I mean, they were reading the same material. Was it because they've read it before? Well, a lot of people who go into do theology, of course, do it because they're Christians. And it's, I, I don't know what the numbers are, but the cliche is that people go and do theology and end up as atheists. Mm -hmm. Well. That might be true, but I guess for a lot of people, especially if you've got that background, then it's kind of stuff you've read before and you mm -hmm. kind of think you know and then it gets deconstructed. Well, for me, I, I kind of hadn't had that background. I didn't have kind of, this was all new and exciting to me and I could kind of accept it on its own terms. And yeah, you, you dig into things, you kind of see where the, you know, what, what kind of goes in to make up the gospels and the kind of the traditions behind mm -hmm. them. But, you know, I never saw that as, as something that kind of was undermining a faith I already had, but kind of, building to a faith I was kind of headed towards. Mm -hmm. So did you have any sort of faith when you started there? I mean, were Not you an all. atheist in the sense of, uh, I think some atheists sometimes will say they're atheists, and then, but they somehow believe in God in their, their own little way. But you really, you thought there was nothing. Oh yeah, I mean, and you know. If Not even the force or anything like no, that? No, nothing like that. If God Delusion had been published then, that, that would have been my book. Um, I was absolutely convinced. That that was the case. Yeah. Now, when you were going through this, your teachers, when it was being taught, were you being taught by people, uh, professors and uh, teachers, who believed that the Gospels were real, or did they view it as like the historical Jesus, or were they, they didn't say? They didn't say. I mean, I think some of them did, and you know, obviously, you know, kind of get get to know people, and and some of them didn't. Um, but it wasn't, you know, it's not a confessional universe. Mm -hmm. Well. It, kind of traditionally was, Oxford, was a <laughs> right. confessional, but it's certainly not in the way theology is taught there wasn't. But what I was doing alongside this kind of intellectual journey, I started hanging out with Catholics. I mm -hmm. met some Dominicans. I started just, just drinking, really, and mm -hmm. going to the pub and being invited around for dinner. And in order to go around for dinner on a mm -hmm. Sunday night, which is kind of the big guest dinner, mm -hmm. you have to go to mass first or you miss, miss the start of dinner. So I was kind of getting mm -hmm. in a very kind of gentle way, not kind of realizing where I was being led by mm -hmm. Providence um, into just a kind of uh, being brought into an attractive community of believers and just kind of seeing it as normal and just seeing the joy of the gospel. Did there. you realize you were being evangelized at the time? No. Okay. I think uh, looking back, I don't know if they realized they were evangelizing me at mm -hmm. the time. Do you have a sense that you were on a path that uh, you look back now and you see all the different steps that have taken happened in your life that led you to where you are today? Well, I mean, obviously looking back from where I am, it, it, you know, it's like kind of looking back Augustine, you know, it's like, you know, the straight lines with um, well, you know, crooked, crooked right. oh, yeah, and um, I mean, from where I am now, it all looks, what looked very accidental and random mm -hmm. now looks like it was Providence. Mm -hmm. So when you actually converted and, and you became a Catholic, how, what was that impact on a, a family? That since obviously you grew up as an atheist, I'm assuming your parents were atheists. Are they still? Well, uh, they're not. Again, I mean, I think a lot of people in Britain, we kind of think of atheism and we have this kind of in our head as Richard Dawkins or Bertrand mm -hmm. Russell. Most people who, I mean, the vast majority of people in, in Britain, even if they tick kind of one of the Christian boxes, probably don't really believe very much and aren't, aren't really sure what they do or don't they believe and, and why and, and aren't really kind of challenged or think it's necessary to really kind of an important thing to really think about. Um, so, you know, religion, you know, it wasn't something that was ever kind of attacked at home or anything. We weren't kind of brought in that. Right. It just wasn't okay, kind of just... railing against the yeah, church of no, England Yeah, no, absolutely. It just, <laughs> it just <laughs> wasn't a kind of a thing. Right. And I think my, I mean, my parents have been great about it, right. but I think, you know, that people are a bit bemused and not just my parents, but, you know, well, why would you? You know, why, well, especially become a Catholic, why would you become a Catholic? In this kind of thing with this kind of atheism, which you've obviously uh, you've written about in, in several books, uh, is it also somewhat, is there a certain amount of theism in this in the sense that a lot of people kind of have that big clockmaker in the sky? They, they think maybe there was somebody at one time who started everything off, but after that, I really don't think about it. Well, I mean, certainly there used to be. I think what we find now is that a lot of people who would call themselves Christian or kind of if asked on a survey with ticker box might gesture towards where well, you kind of got to have something. Mm -hmm. There's something there. 
and that might be as far as they go. I think for a lot of atheists today, I mean, obviously, a lot of the people who we think of in the past as kind of great atheist figures like Voltaire or Thomas Paine or someone mm -hmm. actually weren't. They were deists, really. So they had this right, idea that, right, right. that you need a God. You can't, we, you know, you look around, we've got a universe. You know, you, you need something there. I think actually today, a lot of kind of uh, what you might call self-conscious aids, people mm -hmm. who kind of really put some thought into it, don't think we need that. And um, I think it raises some huge philosophical questions that actually Thomas Aquinas had a good go at. And, you know, the, in The God Delusion, he gets dismissed in about four sentences. Um. Well, one of the things we're talking about, obviously, on the show, we focused on because a couple of books you've written, uh, uh, Faith and Unbelief, and obviously the one on atheism, is the fact that we've always had people who have been atheistic. We, we know yeah. that. But there does seem to be a difference today. There does seem to be kind of almost a virulence to it. Is it different today than it used to be? Well, I mean, I think if you look back and, you know, if you look at some of the, at least anti-religion, not necessarily people like Voltaire, I mean, some of the rhetoric that was being said um, in those kind of periods and the anti-clericalism mm -hmm. in France, I mean, you know, things like, you know, um, you know, wanting to see the, you know, last king, you know, strangled with the entrails of the last priest or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is kind of, you know, extremist rhetoric. So that's always been around. I think what's interesting now is mm -hmm. that the kind of very strong expressions of atheism in Britain and the US, and they kind of arose, the new atheism kind of happened at both sides of the Atlantic around the same time. Mm -hmm. 2004 with Sam Harris, 2006 with The God Delusion, mm -hmm. Christopher Hitchens around the same time, Daniel Dennett. Something kind of touched a social nerve because there's always been those kinds of books. There's always been, you know, strongly argued expressions of atheism, but they've never sold in millions and millions and millions and suddenly been, you know, kind of blanket media coverage. Um, and I think, in a sense, what's new about the new atheism is the social and kind of cultural and media reception. It's as if the kind of, you know, the kind of parable of the sower, it, it depends where the seeds, and it looks mm -hmm. like something was happening in the culture. There's enough fertile ground for yeah, it to catch on. Yeah, that it really Where in the past it might have yeah. been on the rockier yeah, ground. Yeah, of course, to everyone. Kind of I mean, right. you know, you kind of read the, the surprise of the people writing those books at how much it caught on. Well, that tells you there's some sort of vacuum or a void that that needed to be filled, and, and this is filling it. Was there also some sort of event that you think in your mind that you might posit also impacted kind of the receptivity of this kind of atheism uh, that happened in around 2000? Well, I think one of the things that, that really stands out, and you know, in kind of any, any time we think about c significant cultural historical events in that period, obviously 9-11, and not just 9-11, but the 7-7 the bombings in London and, and kind of everything that kind of followed from that. Um, and what strikes me as the most interesting thing about the new atheism is the fact that there hadn't ever really been, at least over the 20th century, kind of a big, loud, populous, atheistic movement in the United States. Now, we'd expect that because conscious vocal expressions of atheism are features of religious cultures because there's no point getting excited about atheism if no one's excited about religion. Mm -hmm. You know, it can, they kind of feed off each other. Mm -hmm. And America's been a extremely religious place throughout the 20th century. So you'd expect to have seen it earlier. So there's a question about why, why then and not before. But mm -hmm. there's also a question, well, if not before, why then? Mm -hmm. And I think 9-11, I mean, because if you think of the Cold War, um, in a sense, you know, the enemy was, was atheism. And that then led to a lot of dampening of social kind of uh, respectability of, of atheism. And you think of someone like Madeleine Murray O'Hare, mm -hmm. um, you know, who really wasn't going to attract a large popular movement around, you know, with kind of, you know, suing NASA for prayers in space and right. prayers in school and that kind of stuff. But once you get a generation who have been brought up completely after the Cold War, I mean, you know, think mm -hmm. it's, it's 25 years since the Berlin Wall came down now. You've, that kind of uh, backdrop's gone. And suddenly, kind of, you know, 2001, mm -hmm. kind of the new enemy isn't people who aren't religious. It's people who seem to be too religious, or at least too religious in the wrong sort of way. And Sam Harris is very kind of upfront about, I wrote, started writing this book, The End of Faith, on uh, September the 12th. Mm -hmm. um, and, the God Delusion, of course, draws a great deal on this kind of ho justified horror at some of the things that get done in the name of religion. So I think that was one of the things that was motivating this. Well, I think it's interesting, too, because I know in your book, The Trinity, How Not to Be a Heretic, which we, we did a book interview on, uh, you talk so much about context that so much of this stuff needs to be understood in yeah. context. Why is that? Well, because, I mean, 
it's a classic thing that, you know, no man is an island. Humans do not exist in kind of uh, a vacuum. And this is a very, this is a very Catholic principle. This, uh, that great book by Henri de Lubac called Catholicism. Mm -hmm. And this idea that kind of humans are social creatures and the church is a social institution. And we see this. So we can't, we're never separate from the cultures and societies and communities that form us and that we interact with and that influence us. And so every time we're kind of looking at kind of how the church kind of operates and exists within cultures, there's that great bit at the beginning of Gaudium et Spes that it talks about uh, the church. It, obviously it's a unique institution, but it's still a community composed of men. Um, so we can never completely abstract what happens in the life of the church and never have mm -hmm. been able to from the kind of the wider social cultural context and the kind of background against which all that gets played out. Mm -hmm. Now you're, you're in the educational business, so to speak, in academia, you came through Oxford. Uh, some of the places that people have the sense, and I think it was Archbishop Sheen who said years ago in the United States, you know, about sending your your child to a, a secular institute, uh, university rather than a Catholic school where his faith would be taken away from him as opposed to be challenged. Is your experience also, in a sense, is there this kind of atheistic culture that permeates the university system, so that's also being inculcated into either marginalized Catholics or Christians, so that what little they have gets kind of blown away? I don't, I mean, I think it, there's, there's not a kind of an elite, liberal, secularist kind of cabal that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's conspiring. I think what it is, is that just the way Britain and, and, and much of Western Europe and other places have gone over the past 50, 60, 70 years, um, is that there's been a actually quite a steep kind of decline in kind of religiosity, religious practice. And so people don't really, they don't have any sympathy or knowledge or kind of acquaintance with not just Christianity, but with kind of other religions. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not that kind of people go off to, to university and there's a kind of a, an emphatic mm -hmm. kind of trying to influence people, because that isn't really what universities are trying to do. I mean, a lot of uh, lecturers in theology, but in all different, are very kind of clear about kind of not giving away their own views, mm -hmm. and they kind of make a real kind of thing about that. Well, they sound like they do better in that in England than they do in the United <laughs> States. Uh, that, that, that does sound like a true. little bit of a difference. But, but I think but. certainly what does happen and what you do see with kind of, you know, children brought up in kind of quite Catholic homes and then they kind of go away to university and you kind of think, well, you know, where, where did the faith go? They don't, mm -hmm. they don't practice anymore. And I think it's, it's more that they've, they've left this close-knit, mutually supportive community mm -hmm. that, that kind of all reinforces each other. And they've gone and those supports have, have kind of left. And it's the same thing on a kind of a bigger scale you kind of see with, I mean, when Benedict was here uh, in his paper visit here, he talked about the decline of what used to be disparagingly referred to as ghetto Catholicism. Mm -hmm. And what he's saying is that this isn't, this isn't a bad thing. It, what it was, was that these were kind of communities of like-minded people, what sociologists kind of call plausibility structures. And that once kind of little Italy's or, you know, little mm -hmm. Germany's kind of, you know, the next generation people move out or new people move in, then you lose that kind of critical mass that's essential right. for this kind of building each other up in the faith. Well, I think uh, certainly in the United States, where the United States is a Christian country, but not a Catholic country, yeah. in a lot of ways, the parish system was the little enclave for the Catholics, and it was the where they socialized and were able to feel uh, that they could be themselves without having to deal with whatever issues there yeah. might be, the anti-Irish, anti-Catholic, anti-Papist kind of things that happened certainly in the United States. And as, as people began to integrate into the culture, there was almost this idea that you have to play down your Catholicism because you don't want to stick out. Yeah, and we see this in Britain with the Irish communities, you know, and we see it again with uh, the Filipino communities or the Polish communities. I mean, for first generation immigrants, then the, the parish mm -hmm. is of course the kind of thing that keeps people together and it's, it's where people can talk the same language and, and, and it has that, cultural and social um, uh, impacts mm -hmm. kind of alongside the religion. But the second, the third generations, that changes. And I think that the recent statistics on America on the, on the Latino community. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. You know, there was, was always this idea thing, right? that, well, you know, 
Latino people are different and they're going to come and they're going to stay as religious as they always have. And I think the, the most recent day, there was a big, I think it was a, a, a Pew Forum mm. poll or something that came out in the past year, right. was suggesting that actually we're seeing the same sorts of patterns that we've seen with every other wave of immigration. Um, so the, what happens is that these tight communities mm -hmm. kind of get diluted into the, the, the wider cultural background. Well, one of the things, you have an article in the, in the Catholic Herald that talked about the new evangelization. I wanted to touch into that. Because one of the cases would be made is, well, obviously when you're, when you're in a captured society where basically everybody's Catholic, so everybody's Catholic, now all of a sudden you have a choice. And people are choosing to opt out more than they are choosing to opt in or stay in. Uh, so isn't that the church's fault? Well. Wouldn't people say that anyway? Well, it's certainly well, what we see in, in Britain particularly, and um, I think, you know, it, we're seeing it elsewhere too. But Western Europe is the classic case. So over the past 50, 60, 70 years, we've seen not just in the Catholic Church, across all mainline denominations, this kind of very rapid kind of secularization. Mm -hmm. And you get a lot of people brought up as something and probably their grandparents were brought up as that and practiced that and it was important. And then their parents were brought up as it and didn't really practice. But then the next generation were kind of baptized and went to the schools. Because in Britain, we have kind of public, publicly funded schools, Anglican schools and Catholic schools and a few Muslim and Jewish schools, too. Right. Private um, and public are reverse over what we think. Of well, no, no. I mean, we, ha we, right. we do have. Yeah, there, there's a sense <laughs> right. in which we have private schools and there's a certain mm -hmm. elite band of those that are called mm -hmm. public schools. But right, we have exactly. state funded public schools. OK. What you'd call public schools that are, that are religious okay. and not just Anglican. There's a huge Catholic um, state funded, state subsidized mm -hmm. kind of sector. Um, so what you then find is that then, you know, those kids are sent to those schools because that's what we've always done and that's what kind of grandma wants and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But kind of with each generation, it, it, it's lessened and lessened. And there comes a point when a kind of a, a cultural Catholicism doesn't get passed on. Mm -hmm. Um, and we, there's, there's In a positive way of saying that. Yeah. Because sometimes cultural Catholicism, people think, well, I'm Catholic in name only. You know, I go to Mass maybe. Maybe I go for Christmas or Easter kind of a thing. But you're really talking about the idea of that support system for Catholics who actually are practicing. Well, I, I kind of mean it right? both. I mean, you get this kind of cultural backdrop, this kind of tight-knit communities, mm -hmm. which I think, you know, we've, we've lost a, probably two generations back at least. Mm -hmm. Then there's this kind of... Uh, people who, it's important to their identity, and I don't want to kind of play down, you know, I mean, this being Catholic is important to people. Um, but if that doesn't get kind of cashed out in practice, mm -hmm. then the next generation, their children, the right. Catholicism isn't important to them. Right, it gets getting less and less yeah. the further they get away. Yeah, and so what we find in the statistics uh, done, not just on Catholics, but kind of across the board in Britain, is that that kind of, again, there's a lot of terminology, but what we might call nominalism, nominal Catholicism. People who just tick the box and that's right, about right. it. That no Made longer gets passed on. Being a Jedi on. Knight or something yeah, exactly, like that. Yeah, exactly. So now you get a, a large number of people who's probably even baptized and, and maybe even, you know, communicated, confirmed, maybe even married in, married in Catholic Church and all that now tick the no religion box. And in Britain, uh, again, it always depends in sociology about kind of how you ask the question and mm. all that kind of stuff. But certainly one of the big annual, very well-respected surveys, British Social Attitude Survey, um, it's around 50% of the population tick no religion. Now, in, in talking about the new evangelization, because here we are in a sense, we have a new group to deal with. Like we're saying, atheists, let alone, you know, we think about evangelization many times in the past. You know, if people say, how many versions of new can there be? But I guess part of it has to do with, in the old days, what we were thinking about was going to Africa or Asia, going to these people who've never heard of Jesus and making sure they understand uh, the great gift that is our Lord's salvation through the Catholic Church, etc. But there's something new about this new evangelization that's different than that. Explain that. Yeah, I mean, this is what John Paul II talks about, Redemptress Missio. I mean, there's a sense in which evangelization always has to be done freshly. It needs to, it always has to have a newness of ardor and a new expressions and that kind of stuff. And that's just evangelization. And it always has been, it always will be. But when he talks about new evangelization, when he, when he kind of coins this kind of technical term, mm -hmm. he's been quite specific what he means. And exactly, classic evangelization is exactly what you've just described. It's mm -hmm. taking 
the, the good news out to people who've kind of never heard of it, never heard of Jesus, never even heard of Christianity, or only very vaguely. Mm -hmm. And this is still important in... Well, we see it in Africa and exactly, parts of Asia it, where, where there are a lot of converts actually to yeah, Catholicism. Yeah, it's still hugely important. But when John Paul II is talking about the kind of the, what you might call the, you know, Christendom, or what mm -hmm. used to be Christendom, these are societies that for the best part of 2,000 years, at least in Europe, have been Christian. But now suddenly we're seeing a growing numbers of kind of post-Christians. So these are historically Christian countries. So in a sense, if, if kind of classic evangelization is taking Jesus to people who've never heard of him, mm -hmm. new evangelization is trying to take Jesus back to people who think they've heard enough about him. <laughs> right, exactly, yeah. right. Uh, I, and so do you run into with that, the person who's basically say, yeah, yeah, I've heard it all before, I understand what you're saying, been there, done that, not interested. Yeah, absolutely, it's a massively harder sell. I mean, I'm not saying that it, it, it's easy to go out and you know take, take Jesus to the Roman Empire. I mean, no, of course, but the challenges are very different. It's a very different kind of evangelization to try and re-excite mm -hmm. people who kind of think of themselves as either maybe still as Christians, mm. oh, well, yeah, we tick that box, we were baptized or whatever. Who are you to come and tell me how to be a Christian and what I ought to believe and what Catholics are meant to believe or anything like that? So, but the, the kind of the broader point is that, you know, it's like kind of, it's, there used to be a, it must be, I think it's an American advert, the head and shoulders advert, the anti dandruff right, shampoo. Sure, right, you never right. get a second chance to make a first impression. Right. People who've been kind of brought up as, as Catholic or Episcopalian or Methodist, and for whatever reason, that's never excited them enough to keep going after they've left home or, mm -hmm. or whatever. To then try and bring them back and to excite them um, is a far harder sell. It's a bit, I always think it's a bit like, in fact, it's, uh, Richard Dawkins has the metaphor of the virus of faith that he means in a very negative way. Mm -hmm. uh, he kind of, you know, this kind of infective kind of plague. But actually, there's a kind of a more positive way. You know, we, there's that kind of uh, phrase about, you know, religion isn't... Um, uh, persuaded it's, it's caught, it, it's mm -hmm. right, exactly. okay. it's right. con this contagion of, of joy. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously if you think about immunizations, the whole idea is that as you get injected with a dead strain of something so that you're resistant to the live strains that might kind of come and take hold of you, kind of come. Um, and there's a sense in which I think some of the kind of the vestiges of Christianity and kind of what might get called cultural Catholicism or nominal Catholicism mm -hmm. Ha can have that effect. It can prevent people ever really looking at Christianity, ever looking at Catholicism, um, as something new and exciting and challenging and, and strange. And y if you think back to kind of 1 Corinthians, mm -hmm. when, you know, Christ and him crucified is, you know, scandal to the Jews, foolishness to the Gentiles, it's very difficult to see it as either of those things. Um, you know, as the potential of something that might be exciting, something to challenge you, something mm -hmm. to orient your life around. If you think you've been there, done yeah. that, and that was kind of 15 years of boredom at, at school and, and Sundays. Right. Well, thank you, Steve. I'm going to take a break. Speaking with Stephen Bullivant, author of several books, including The Trinity, How Not to Be a Heretic. Speaking of books, don't forget Reflections by Father Leo Clifford. You've got to check that book out. It's available through the EWTN Religious Catalog. Stay with us right here. We'll be back with much more with Stephen Bullivant after this message. Staying with us, I'm Doug Keck, sitting in for 
Father Mitch Paqua talking with Stephen Bullivant, a senior lecturer in theology and ethics from St. Mary's University in London across the pond, and the author of several books, including the Oxford Handbook on Atheism, and also this book on faith and unbelief, and another book on the Trinity, How Not to Be a Heretic, all available through the EW10 Religious Catalog at 1-800-854-6316. Go to our website, EW10RC.com. EW10RC, RC's for really Catholic. Dot com. Okay, just remember that. Best place to find the great materials of Mother Angelica, the holy reminder she'd like you to have. So let me ask you, we were talking about the whole idea of atheism, the challenge of the new evangelization, and you were talking about how to reach young people, not reach young people. Is there a sense, I always think, here in the United States, we see a certain amount of evangelization that doesn't fit the mode of Catholics re-evangelizing Catholics, but nominal Catholics being evangelized by other Christian denominations who maybe have a more uh, uh, powerful style or evangelical style or whatever. Are you seeing that in, in, in the UK as well? Well, I mean, the British statistics, the vast majority of people who are brought up Catholic who now no longer identify as Catholic tick no religion. Mm -hmm. There's a kind of about 5% of them, maybe a few more, 7%, who now tick a, a different box. And around 3% of those tick kind of the Anglican box and probably around the same number tick another type mm -hmm. of Christian group. And I think what you find first of all is that the kind of, the, I mean there's a sense in which if you're brought up Catholic and um, you're kind of Catholic or you're not. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if you're brought up in certain kind of Protestant denominations with a weaker ecclesiology, then mm -hmm. if you're brought up Baptist, it doesn't really matter if you then go and find an attractive Methodist church, at least in Britain. Right, I mean, yeah, yeah, even here some kinds, of, it was kind of surprising to me that someone would flow between Methodism and Presbyterianism Baptist, many times by the fact of moving from one part of the country to another yeah. and finding a church or a pastor Absolutely. they like. Right. Yeah, and I think that's less so with Catholics, but certainly what you find, well, first of all, you find that kind of there's very few denominations that really are out actively evangelizing. Mm -hmm. And the ones that are tend to be evangelical Protestants. Mm -hmm. And that could be evangelical Protestants within the Anglican Church or of other, other kind of denominations. Um, and what you find is that there's a lot of uh, Catholic kind of, you know, count up the numbers, mm -hmm. it, it's big numbers, um, that you find former Catholics who join these churches saying that they find something there that they didn't get mm -hmm. uh, at Catholic Church. And that might be reading the Bible, that might be a, com a welcoming community, that mm -hmm. might be a kind of a, a vibrant sense of, you know, joy at mm -hmm. Jesus. Right. Okay. Yeah. So personal relationship. Yeah, with absolutely. Our Lord. Right. Um, so you know they kind of look back very negatively on what they see as a kind of uh, a moribund, lifeless um, Catholicism, mm -hmm. and they see something new and exciting in some of these Protestant groups. And that's that. But that isn't huge numbers. But there is certainly some of that. Now, whether whether that is kind of evangelical groups actively seeking to, to find Catholics yeah, and bring them. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. I, 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 I don't think there's very much of that actually. Right, okay. Well, let me ask you too with, with, with that. How does the church see it? Let's say, let's say the, you, you mentioned the statistics. You talk about the ideas that I think for every one person who converts to Catholicism, uh, four kind of drop off the map. In so America. Speak, in the United yeah. States, which is better. It's one in 10, isn't it? One in, in 10. Okay. One in 10. But the only, but there's actually good news there because the fact is as bad as we are, the other mainline churches certainly in, in the UK are worse, right? Yeah. I mean, that's a positive spin. I mean, you look at these statistics and certainly the, the retention level. So uh, in Britain, about 60% of cradle Catholics still tick the Catholic box. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a large proportion of those aren't going to mass maybe ever, mm -hmm. but they still feel some kind of connection. Some of them are. I mean, don't, go, don't get me wrong. I mean, they're all. Does they're that all. also account, you know, I'm Irish, so I'm Catholic or anything? Yeah, like that, exactly. Amount of that. Um, and although I think that's, you know, as the generations go on, that and becomes as less the and less. as the church in Ireland has so many, well, has had course. so many difficulties, right? right? Yeah. But what you see is that, you know, a 62% retention rate, mm -hmm. which actually is pretty, pretty dreadful. Um, other denominations had killed for it. It's far and away the best retention rate of all the mainline denominations in, in Britain. So I think the Anglican numbers uh, are somewhere in the 50s. Mm -hmm. But so, like, some of the historic, you know, very, uh, in, in the 19th century, very evangelical religions, uh, like Methodism, 
I mean, the retention rates there are kind of 30 to 40 percent. Now, what you find is that there's a greater proportion of people brought up Methodist who then go and join another kind of denomination. So again, there's an ecclesiolog ecclesiological backdrop to some of this. Mm -hmm. But certainly in terms of keeping people, Catholics do very well comparative to others. Bringing in new people, we're almost the worst. Now, I'm wondering with that, too, in the, in the sense of, I, I think I understood one time a statistic that was, though there's dramatically more uh, official members of the Church of England, there's actually, in theory, more Catholics at Mass on any given Sunday than there is a total number of Anglicans who are actually going to church on that same Sunday. Yeah, in terms of uh, practicing um, Christians, in terms of, as I say, you know, being, being in there on church on a Sunday, uh, Catholicism is the country's main religion in, mm -hmm. on, on that statistic. Yeah. Is that why we saw such a positive reception when our Holy Father was there? Well, the astonishing thing um, with the papal visit was, uh, I mean, I don't know how much of the kind of the pre-coverage you got here, but the mood, mm -hmm. even within the Catholic Church, was not um, very positive. Right. Even people who were personally very excited, like myself, and I'd only been a Catholic a couple of years, and my wife had just been received right. at the vigil that year, so kind of six months before, um, and, and the Holy Father was coming to St. Mary's, so for St. Mary's, this was huge mm. for us. Um, but even people like ourselves who were very excited didn't think that other Catholics would be very excited. And there was a lot of kind of fears that there'd be kind of empty events and, mm. and all that kind of stuff. So you get the backlash from the media and people exactly. who are poo-pooing what it's exactly. going to really be, yeah. you know. And the the change mm -hmm. as soon as he kind of touched down in scotland and it was a beautiful sunny day mm -hmm. and there was school kids lining the streets with ice creams right. you know cheering him on from that moment on the mood of the and, and not just the catholic community the mood of the entire country mm -hmm. was astonishing and the media coverage was overwhelmingly positive you know the bbc right. got dozens of complaints after it for this kind of uh, uncritically positive, <laughs> right. uh, which, you know, isn't something that the BBC normally gets complained at for. Right, right. Um, and, the, what, and then the, one of the tabloid newspapers, the, you know, when he'd left, had the headline, the, the People's Pope. Now, for tabloid newspapers in Britain, mm -hmm. that's a very clear reference to the People's Princess. To Diana, oh, I see. and they okay. are not the kind of comparisons that our tabloid newspapers Especially, make. Especially uh, for a German pope. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> At the same time. But and uh, he was on the front cover of the Baptist Herald mm -hmm. uh, or the Baptist Times or whatever, it is. and it was an astonishing few days. Well, I know, and Joanna Bogle is, we yeah, yeah. said, one of your students and a good friend of ours at the network for many, many years. But one of the hopes I know they had was that that Benedict's visit at the time would help to revitalize the ch church in the UK and move things forward. Has that helped? Well, I think what we see is that, you know, we, we, we talk, and I, you know, the kind of work I do talk a lot about decline and depressing mm -hmm. statistics, and we need to do that. We need to, you know, look realistically at these. But what we're also seeing, we're seeing some great signs of hope, and we're mm -hmm. seeing it particularly among young people. Okay. Um, and that's partly because the kind of young people who get to university, who are still at mass on a Sunday, have been, you know, there's that Chesterton line about it takes a living thing to swim against the tide. Mm -hmm. And they've been doing that all their, all their lives, um, probably against even their own family practice. I mean, some of them have come, have come from kind of, you know, very Catholic families, but a lot of them, you know, their families find it a bit strange that they're very pious. Um, and they've had to argue for it among their friends all the way. And then suddenly, you know, they've got, they come to a university, a chaplaincy or something, or go to one of the movements or all go to World Youth Day. And they say other people they're who connect. are in the same right, boat. And right, it's this right. kind of, you know, we talked about um, kind of what was called ghetto Catholicism, but first generation immigrants having that kind mm. of self reinforcing effect. We're seeing that with young people. And for the first time in, in decades, we're starting to see vocations grow. Um, and Benedict was, I mean, one of the, the big things, because I mean, all the caricatures of Benedict, mm -hmm. then as now, was that this is an out of touch, mm -hmm. uh, you know, at best scholar, at worst kind of, you know, Rottweiler. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing that took everyone by surprise, apart from actually kind of the young people themselves, was the connection and the love between kind of him and the young people. There were some wonderful scenes kind of outside of Westminster Cathedral of the Pope and young people, and they love him. Mm -hmm. And again, the kind of the, the, the young people, kind of some of my students, and I guess not that young now, I know. Um, for me and my wife, and you know, because obviously we're both converts, you know, mm -hmm. John Paul II and Benedict, 
have been very important to these people. So to have Benedict there with them, I mean, that, I think that is, and just for us as new converts going to the, the beatification of John Henry Newman, this outdoor mass with 40,000 other Catholics. Right, I mean, right. you know, we saw the World Youth Day, not the World Youth Day, uh, the papal visit to the Philippines with 8 million. That right. kind of put it into perspective. But for us, 40,000 fellow yeah. Catholics, it was just a wonderful, affirming moment for the community. Right. Well, one of the things, too, I was thinking about while you were talking about that is, so ha has the church, the Catholic church, made efforts to try to, re you know, like I said, in a sense, build on this? I mean, have there been more outreaches and other things that have been tried to, or does the church itself, you know, some people try to do it, but that sometimes the structures are not set up that way, and there's a tradition of the way we normally do things. How is that working? Well, I think a lot, a lot of effort and thought went around the papal visit, and a lot of things like Catholics come home, mm -hmm. and a lot of attempts to welcome back um, Catholics and also to kind of reach out and put a positive message out there. A lot of done because you know you get a big event and a lot of effort goes into that, and then everyone's like, okay, we've done that for a bit. Mm. So I think a lot of effort went, and, and there was a real in terms of kind of people coming through the RCIA. There was a real you know that kind of 2011, the year later, mm -hmm. was a kind of a big high. Um, so a lot went in then. But I oh, think is that flattened out now? Well, the the statistics that I've just seen in the last two years um, are kind of the lowest we've had for some years, mm -hmm. and. There's a lot of, you know, there's fluctuations year on year and, you know, what it might be is that obviously if you've had one big year, mm -hmm. then you're always going to have lower years later. So you might not want to read too much into those. Well, sometimes you end up pulling people forward who well, maybe exactly. on the yeah, exactly. make, decide you to know, make You know, that's going to be the year to do it. And also, right. of course, that year we had the ordinariate. So we had a lot of Anglicans coming in as well. Right. Um, but what you do find is that young people, again, because these, the, mm -hmm. these are the people who are there for a reason, are excited to be Catholic, are there because they think it's something attractive and something joyful and something they want to share with others, and that therefore other people see that. And, and is that also the thing, I think, with our present Holy Father, who, you know, uh, quote-unquote, is very popular with the secular media out there and things like that. And, and, and I was thinking about John Paul II, obviously, and, and Benedict, and now our present Holy Father, but is it the fact that it's their persona or is it they personify the truth? They're there representing the truth when they come there, and that's what attracts people. Well, I think it's both, mm -hmm. um, and I think we saw this with, with John Paul II, who, of course, had a great deal of charisma and actually went out, and mm -hmm. go, the, those events where people come together and go and see the Pope and all come together, they're huge. So, you know, a Pope traveling the world for that mm -hmm. was, was hugely important for, for the community. And much different, Britain. obviously, than what people experienced Absolutely. before. Absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, you can't, you can't separate the, the kind of the medium from the message. And mm -hmm. one of the great things about Francis is that people the world over kind of see a man preaching, you know, the Beatitudes or Matthew 25. Mm -hmm. And they see in this Pope because of some of the kind of the big actions he's done and what we know about, you know, how he lived when he was a cardinal in Buenos Aires mm -hmm. and everything. They see that kind of, you know, the teachers and witnesses thing of Paul VI. But I mean, you know, Paul VI didn't make it up. It's been right there from the mm -hmm. beginning. This hugely important kind of thing for evangelization. We've got, to, we've got to practice what we preach. People see that in Francis and they didn't see it in Benedict. And that was unfair to Benedict, mm -hmm. um, you know, ben <laughs> Pope Benedict lived a very humble life. Oh, exactly, very, uh, right. Absolutely. Um, and media spin is, is a lot of it. Um, and obviously, I think one of the dangers we have... Well, it didn't fit the, into their scenario absolutely. of who he was. And they had a preconceived view of what he, uh, his papacy was going yeah, sure, to be the like. The Panzer Cardinal and of the course. Rottweiler and everything um, else like that. And Francis is... Because, partly because no one had heard of him. Mm -hmm. I mean, really. And he was able to create this... Kind of, again, you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. Yeah, right. Good he point. had that first week to make a great first impression. Oh, he was a blank slate for most people. Absolutely. I mean, it was a surprise when he was elected. Yeah. Most people assumed he had been, was too old at that point. Yeah. So, I mean, what we're seeing with Francis now is that, you know, people, people seem to be surprised every time he defends Catholic doctrine. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we, we, I think we're beginning to see this kind of disappointment in him from right. within the church, too because they, they kind of projected on him, onto him all these, I mean, in, the way, mm -hmm. in the way that people projected onto Benedict all these kind of fears about a repressive, you know, crackdown that's going to come with a Benedict papacy, which didn't happen at all. With Francis, they projected on these absurd hopes mm -hmm. of kind of large-scale changes to doctrine right. that, that just isn't where Francis They're is at. And it's not where the successor of Peter is, is right, ever going right. to be at. 
Well, the truth is the truth. So within within that, uh, you know, the praxis of the church still has to Absolutely. be reflective of that. Yeah, because that's the thing, like you said, and in some days, uh, ways, I think there was also that a little bit with John Paul too, and certainly with Benedict, where maybe some of the more traditional-minded people projected onto him the idea that, well, we're going to go, they, they wouldn't say it, but we're really going back before Vatican yeah. II, or we're going to really, everybody will go be back doing the Latin Mass, et cetera, yeah. like that. And so there's that disappointment all the time that, that people have to deal with. And that's when I think you always have to step back and, and realize that at the end of the day, the church is our mother, the magisterium is still there. There are different styles, some we like, some we don't like. It doesn't change our, our belief system. Yeah, and absolutely, and I think that's important. And you know, obviously when I was becoming a Catholic and kind of on you know, a very gradual journey and, and even, you know, you don't, you don't suddenly see how it all fits together perfectly at the beginning and there's bits that attract you and bits that you kind of think, mm, I'm not quite sure about that. And I can't ever see me accepting that. Um, but then, you know, what you find is that you begin to see how it all connects up. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we're seeing this with young people because young people, you know, they're, there's certain things that they've kind of always known as Catholic and certain things that people have said, oh, that's, mm, mm -hmm. that's, that's still on the books, but no one ever, things like, you know, humana vitae, all kinds of stuff. But actually the young people um, who've, who've not been brought up with kind of that in their, even in their Catholic schools, no one ever talks about it. I, mean, mm -hmm. I don't know what it's like here. Um, but suddenly they're discovering it and they're actually reading these texts and not just on these sorts of issues and saying, well, actually, there's something here. This well, again, is great. Your whole point in your books when you talk about context, yeah. that idea that many of these things were pulled out of context and dealt that yeah, way. Yeah. The other thing I think which, which is uh, for young people to see, I think, in, in, in that I see happening is just the idea that they've, they've watched their parents and to some degree themselves buy into what the secular culture told them would make them happy and how it was going to work and how it's going to be so wonderful. And they've already had some experiences, whether to watch their own families have difficulties, uh, those kind of failures, problems in their own lives, whatever, and start to realize there's got to be something more than this. And that's why the atheism, it's so, you know, you think there's got to be less. I mean, how can you hold on to anything if this is all there is? Well, I mean, I think you're absolutely right that, you know, there's always this there's always a kind of a utopian kind of, you know, all we need to do is do this, this and this, or get rid of this, mm -hmm. and that's gonna solve all the problems. And of course, that we live in a fallen world. That's, well, that's, getting rid of, that's, what, what's it, that's a heresy usually, of one of those things. Yeah, right? of course. Yeah. But we also see this in the secular, I mean, I think one of the things that gets missed with, say, the God delusion, and one of the reasons why it was so um, popular and affirming, especially in America, mm -hmm. um, was it's, a, it's actually a very positive book. It's a very affirming book that it's possible to be a moral, um, you know, atheist who, you know, leads a meaningful life and that this is something to be proud of. And it very consciously adopts kind of some of the, the kind of the metaphors and rhetoric mm. from the feminist movements and the kind of the gay pride movements, the atheist pride and coming out as an atheist and all this. And, you know, if you'd been brought up in, I don't know, there's somewhere in the Midwest in kind of a small town when, and, but you know, you felt, you felt sympathy with these ideas, but you didn't really have people you could talk to and you probably thought that if you ever kind of told your parents that you'd be ostracized and that kind of stuff. And then suddenly, you know, remember that the internet, we've got the right, rise of the right. internet around kind of time. Right. Suddenly you find people on the internet who share these views. Mm -hmm. Suddenly there's a book by an Oxford professor mm -hmm. um, that's featured on, you know, South Park and all kinds of stuff. And he's a genius. Yeah, of course. So. Um, saying all these things, just kind of the things you're waiting to hear. So it speaks to you in a very powerful way. Um, so this kind of malaise that, that a lot of people have with all cultures, because you know, we're never gonna find a uh, perfect satisfaction in this life, which mm -hmm. is what Augustine found right, exactly. you know, a very long time ago. You know, this, right. this was a guy who hadn't, it's not that he hadn't sampled the pleasures of right, the world, exactly. he had, and then he realized that the thing he was really looking for um, couldn't be found. Well, in a way, he's a perfect saint for today because he's, the, he's yeah, like yeah. the saint who lived through the 60s and the 70s and then started to realize that uh, all of this, uh, you know, sex, drug, and, ro and rock and roll was not working out yeah. for him and that there needed to be something more than that. And it didn't mean that he was so quick to give it up or that there wasn't some pleasures out of that. I wonder also, what when you find yourself, and maybe you've had people come to you now because they knew you were an atheist, you became a, a Catholic, uh, when they talk to you and they say, I'm thinking about this, I'm troubled, what, what are usually the things that they need to overcome to make that leap to become a Catholic? 
Well, a lot of, I think a lot of the people, um, especially young people, they have trouble, I mean, sex is always a big thing. Mm -hmm. um, they're trouble, well, on, I think on the one hand that people are troubled by the culture. We mm -hmm. see this with the objectification of women, we see this with the kind of the, the rape culture online, we see this with all kinds of very pathological tendencies that we see, in, whereas the promise was always that this was gonna be, get rid of the repression and that kind of stuff, and right, it was right. gonna be great. Yeah. We see with marital breakdown, we see all kinds of stuff. Um, but equally, no one, thinks that, you know, the, I mean, I'm gonna call it the, the Catholic answer, but actually until probably 20 years before Humana Vitae, it was the, the Christian answer. It was, a, it was a very ecumenical thing. Um, well, like abortion and things yeah, like that. Yeah, of course. Too, no? Um, no one is ever presenting that as something positive. So mm -hmm. people, are, people know there's something wrong. With, they see it with their friends, they see, probably see it in their own lives. But, they also kind of have this idea that, well, the solution that's being proposed, that the, what they've heard about it mm -hmm. is wrong too. Um, and I think one of the difficulties is, is just being able to show people what, what actually the church teaches. And it's, that's always the case. Mm -hmm. So many of the objections to Catholicism about authority or about the Eucharist or about the Trinity or about anything, once you actually know what the church teaches and why mm -hmm. and understand it, then actually it begins to kind of make sense. And I mean, when I was becoming a Catholic, there's all sorts of issues that I you know, didn't quite get. But mm -hmm. I think quite consciously, I always thought, well, if, if there's a problem I have with kind of what the church teaches with the magisterium, then that's primarily a problem for me mm -hmm. and not a problem for the church that the church needs to sort out to kind of, you know, get to where I am to kind of become as, as en enlightened as I am. And, and there's always that, you know, we need to kind of, have the humility, really, mm -hmm. to not to, sun, to suddenly say, "Well, okay, I'm just going to, I'm just going to sign up to it. I'm just going to agree to it." I mean, the, we we had the the phrase gradualism that came out a lot in the synod, right. and there was a lot of kind of polemics either way. I think actually, kind of gradualism is the way that most of us mm -hmm. either come to faith from having had none, or deepen our faith right. from having had some. Well, I think, yeah, exactly. We want people to be on the path and on the yeah. road and, and to, to move. But the, the main thing is to end up at where they need to end up ultimately yeah. and not say hanging out on the road someplace is still okay. Yeah. Our Lord loves you where you are, but he loves you too much to leave you there, yeah. you know, to move you forward. So in the future for young people, who, one of the things that strikes me is their lack of historical knowledge. And I think that impacts greatly, and, and certainly you write about the early church fathers in your, in your books, and that whole idea of continuity from the beginning of the church to today. And even like you said, the idea that people would not realize that, you know, that 50 years ago, the things, it's like the world has turned upside down. Yeah. The things that were good or bad, the things that are bad are now good. But unless you understand that, the, that most of what's going on today might be old heresies, but they're, they're fairly new ideas that are being promoted as being uh, the future. And also, isn't there this idea of elitism in the sense that we're getting smarter? And so, you know, uh, I appreciate that good old Augustine did the best he could, but you yeah. know what I mean? He doesn't have as many brain cells cooking as, as Dawkins does. Yeah. Well, certainly, I mean, there's a, there's a lack of historical knowledge generally people don't, I mean, it's partly because there's so many other things that people have to learn these days and, you know, technology and all kinds of stuff. So, But it's not just an issue to do with religion. But I remember I was teaching some uh, postgraduates kind of, um, and, you know, these, are, these would have been students who've gone through Catholic schools and all mm -hmm. kinds of stuff. And I was telling them about, I think it was Jesus, it was, it was Divas and Lazarus or it was Matthew 25 or something. And girl raised her hand and said, this sounds a lot like communism. Was communism before Jesus or after Jesus? Really? Yeah. But that just kind of lack of knowing where stuff fits in, even kind of mm. big things, I think is a problem. But it's not just a well, problem. Well, wasn't the, the early church, church basically a well, communist? Well, uh, I think uh, I then meant communist? talked about Acts 2 and all that, you know, they right. hold everything in common. But and then that they kind decided that it didn't work out so well. Well, I think mm -hmm. the, the, the difficulty of what we see in Acts is that we have this beautiful vision, and it, it's, a, it's a wonderful vision of evangelization because we see how the straight after Pentecost, the apostles come together, they share everything in common. And there's a bit about and the kind of the perception of them in the eyes of all the people grows. And day by day, the Lord was adding to their numbers. Kind of the next chapter, 
you know, people are embezzling money and, and then it, you know, then... Right, so original sin is a wonderful thing, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. <laughs> and, and again, this is kind of, we, you know, we all think about troubles in the church and that kind of stuff. Read the New Testament, you read the lives of Paul, you right. read Acts. This is not a new thing. Well, one of the things that always struck me, a very simplistic sense of, I said, you know, the New Testament and everything besides knowing that it's true, it's got to be true, or even the Old Testament, because if it wasn't, somebody would have cleaned it up by now. You know, I mean, you know what I mean? If you were doing PR for that, you would have said, well, we've got to cut out some of this stuff. Let's change this. We don't want to have so many people being killed or wiped out, and we certainly don't want all these problems. And this Judas guy, that's not a good, he's not a good example for us. Uh, why don't we just omit him mm -hmm. and, and have everybody together and just doing wonderfully? But we don't see that. We see humanity living itself out in the church, which is the whole idea. We're all sinners, right? Yeah, and absolutely, I mean, and you see this with the depiction of the disciples. I mean, if you think of, you know, when the Gospels actually get committed in, to writing in the form that we know them, by this time, Peter was known to have been this great heroic martyr and the leader right. of the church. You know, you're not, gonna, you're not gonna write back into it stories of him betraying Christ and, and running off and all that kind of thing, or just the kind of the stupid questions he asks right. if they weren't there. And so all the stuff about, you know, the, Clearly, the disciples at Easter thought that that was the end. Right. And if they hadn't, then they, we, they wouldn't be depicted as having thought that if that hadn't really happened. Well, there's a future for the church <laughs> in the UK with uh, young people like yourself, and I say young person. Stephen's books, The Oxford Handbook on Atheism, also Faith and Unbelief, and his most recent book, The Trinity, How Not to Be a Heretic, all at EW10's Religious Catalog, EW10RC.com. Best news, Father Mitch will be back next week. I'm Doug Keck. Thank you for so much joining us here on EWTN Live. See you next time.